you know, we really do have a wonderful time on Saturday mornings at the men's breakfast, and Brother Derek was there, and Jeff was there, and John was there, and Mike Donahue wasn't there, but that's okay. But uh, I tell you what, Pastor John was on fire yesterday, and he was not taking any prisoners at all. I know what goes on at the country house is supposed to stay at the country house, but as John was on a roll, Brother Joel was back there looking like the cat that ate the canary, and he was grinning from ear to ear, and all I could think of was the Civil War, <laughs> when families fought against family, and here's Joel, he goes out to watch the battle, and he doesn't care who wins, he just wants to make sure there's a lot of blood shed, so... <laughs> <laughs> but it was a it was a great time. And I tell you, it uh, uh, truly these these meetings got started years ago. We call them ISI meetings, Iron Sharpeneth Iron, and uh, it's a great time of challenge. We can learn and uh, and just enjoy the fellowship. So praise the Lord for that. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter four. Romans chapter 4. We'll begin reading in verse 17. Actually, let's back up to verse 16. We'll read down to the end of the chapter. Here's one of the greatest principles of grace and why God has to deal with us in grace. In God's sovereignty, he chose grace. And he says this, therefore, it is of faith, and it is, is the imputed righteousness, that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it is imputed unto him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Let's pray. Father, as we think about this passage before us, and we just think about Abraham and his faith, but we recognize the thing that was so remarkable about Abraham's faith was not anything to do with him, but the object of his faith, which is you. And we just glorify you, we praise you, we honor you, and we pray through the things we say and do today that would not only lift up your name, but the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we, in the sin of his name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we continue moving to chapter 4, we don't want to lose sight of, um, of the context. We don't lose sight of what Paul's been trying to go through. I mean, we go through this week after week after week, and I can understand, well, what did we talk about three weeks ago? What was the context? What was the point that Paul was making, and it's easy for us to sometimes get beyond that and maybe not fully recognize what's going on. But come back to chapter 3. As Paul's coming down through this, he comes and he, he reaches a conclusion, and I trust we all have come to the same conclusion. For all, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The theme of the book of Romans is not just that it's salvation by grace through faith for believers in the dispensation of grace. There's never been anybody saved apart from being by grace through faith. 
It's always been God's design that people be saved by grace through faith. Maybe the message may have changed, but therefore it is of grace, that it, of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure. God could not require in any age from any man, not require them to do something, because God would have no control over whether they did it right or not. He takes us completely out of the equation, and he says, here, here's the message. Can you just believe the message? As we'll find out, that's what Abraham did. And that's what we do today. We believe that Christ, when he went to Calvary, he paid the price for our sins. And we say praise the Lord for that. You know the law, and in verse 24, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Here's what God thought about the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. How many years do you think God knew about the coming sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary? Way back in eternity past. He just had to sit there and he had to put up with the sinfulness of man because there had to be the right time to reveal it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, For had they known it, had they knew what God knew about the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The speaking of Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. And this was all that God could do in time past through the forbearance of God. Now there's some times I know we've all been through some difficult circumstances. And in those circumstances we just said, did we have the fortitude and the wherewithal to forbear it until we passed through it? And, you know, sometimes we do and sometimes we didn't. But I think we don't really know to the extent of what sin did and what sin, the impact that sin had upon God the Father and, hit, and how it offended his righteousness. But God said, okay, it's bad, but I can forbear it because I know the quality of the sacrifice is going to come. He says in verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. What happened between verse 25 and 26 is we're living in the dispensation of grace now. The, the cross is in the past. And so now God can reveal to us the truth about all that was going on with Christ at Calvary. And so now we can understand, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that he, that's God, might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Uncle Lee's 90 years old. He says, well, after talking about freely justified and the faith of Abraham, he says, I, I believe. Of course, we know Uncle Lee's been a believer for, what, 112 years now. <laughs> But the good news of Christ at Calvary. And he says, where is boasting then? Verse 27. It's excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now the reason why we put this emphasis on all men of all ages, there's some discussion even amongst the mid-Acts dispensationalists, was about the eternal security of the Old Testament saint. I believe that anybody whose sins were paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has eternal security. But he says here in verse 29, Is he the God of the Jews only? Now, if you're reading Romans, and this is what Paul wants to the question he raises, who, is, who do you think would be having that question? The Jews or the Gentiles? 
the Jew, the Gentiles are going to have that question because up until just late, they've been on the outside looking in, and they want to know, is this issue of justification by grace through faith? Is it to the Jews only, or could it possibly apply to us as well? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God who shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Now, man being the way that man is, sometimes they look at that by faith and through faith and try to say, okay, well, wow, this is something deep, this is something different, this is something special. God justified the circumcision by faith, but he justified the uncircumcision through faith. What's the nom number one denominator, or common denominator in these phrases? Faith. faith. <laughs> can, the, can a preposition or the use of a preposition modify or do something to change the effectiveness of faith? And the answer is no. It's faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. How can we establish the law? The law can't justify anybody. The law can't do anything for anybody. The law only proved guilt. But yet there was an absolute righteous standard in the law. That was made known by the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we take a look at verse 24, he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who has been justified freely by the grace of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus? All men of all ages. And so the issue has always been Christ. The main character in God's plan of redemption was his son, and only his son. Whether anybody in time past knew it is irrelevant. God knew it. And the way man in time past had access to it was by faith. We take a look and we recognize that the law didn't do anything but produce guilt. It says, now we know, verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. I say, I don't want to be part of that system. And yet there are believers all over the world today who are clamoring to take their place under a denominational setting which says you are going to, God is dealing with you on the principle of this if-then. If you keep my commandments, you get blessed. If you don't get, keep my commandments, you're going to be cursed. But that's not the issue of justification. Now we know, and we say when we read that, do we know this, that what things soever the law saith, is saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, why? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law could say, thou shalt not, and if you did it, you broke the law. The law could say, thou shalt, and then if you didn't, you broke the law. And the law had one word for every time you broke the law, and that was guilty. James even takes it up a notch. If you break one commandment, you're guilty of them all. Well, we just need to keep turning our pages because certainly we hope that God has something different. If that was our system, praise God, we, it would have been fantastic. It's not our system today. And it does not honor God for us to deal, for us to pretend like he's dealing with us under the law. I know people who think that somehow they can, can apply the principles of the law and God's going to look at them and say, thank you for all the things that you're doing for me. And God just says, why don't you trust my son? Why don't you trust in the finished work of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished at Calvary? So being justified freely, verse 24, by his grace, and that's the grace of God 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Come to chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but that to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, this is a promise made to Abraham, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they are. Sometimes we look at this and we know that uh, the, the promise that God made to Abraham was that he'd be the father of many nations. And this is a parenthetical portion of that verse. And sometimes it might cause us to miss the real impact of what Paul wants us to know. What Paul wants us to know that Abraham understood was that Abraham did not believe as he was expressed just in the promise. But it is the object of Abraham's faith who is God. It says, before him whom he believed, even God. I don't care how many good sermons we think we have heard and how much we've heard, I tell you, the object of our faith needs to be God. It needs to be God. Now we understand today that God is dealing with us and it... it Sometimes people say, is God talking to people today? We say, yeah, but it has to be a qualified yes, doesn't it? He talks to us through his word. He said everything that he's going to say. He had it collected and put into a book which we have today. We can read it and believe it and trust it in every aspect of our life. God speaks to us today. He even gives us an infallible teacher, the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Wow. God promised Abraham back in Genesis, we won't go there, chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. He just reiter reiterated what he had promised him in chapter 12, that he would be the father of many nations. But you know what that meant? Abraham needed an heir. Abraham needed someone that could be his heir. Abraham needed a son. Well, what was the problem? Abraham and Sarah didn't have any children of their own. There was a time when they took matters into their own hand. Unless we never really understand what would cause Hagar to offer, I mean uh, Sarah to offer Hagar to Abram, Abraham, we don't realize the pressure they were under. The promise, I will make of you a great nation. One year goes by, a decade goes by, two decades, three decades. Might have been some finger pointing going on somewhere along the line. Well, whose fault is it? And finally, Sarah says, Here, take Hagar. We'll find out if it's you or me. <laughs> Turned out not to be anything wrong with Abraham. It was the deadness of Sarah's womb. But here in verse 18, he says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. The Lord comes to Abram. They break bread together. And he says, What give me seeing I go childless? Here. Here's Eleazar. He's going to be mine heir. God says, No, I'm not going to take that one. And come over here and says, tell me if you can number the sand. That's how your seed's going to be. You will not be able to number them. So Abraham says, well, 
something's got to change then. And of course something does. We take a look and he says, sometimes we think that our identification with Abraham, though, because he is the father of us all, somehow is what the basis of our identification to the Lord Jesus Christ is, but it's not that way. It is just the opposite. We are identified with Abraham because of our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. Under Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 16. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Come on down to verse 26. 26 to 29. It's not seed plural. It's seed singular. It's seed as in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then, and only then, are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. A lot of confusion in Christianity today about the promises God made to Israel. And that if the church, the body of Christ, has somehow become spiritual Israel. But because we're identified with Abraham, doesn't mean we're going to become the recipients of the physical blessings that God started telling Abraham about. We're not going to be Take over. We are not spiritual Israel. We're not going to be the one who's going to assume and take over the responsibility. You know who will fulfill the promises God made to Israel? Israel. Israel's going to do it. God will fulfill their promise. But he says, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. Not heir of the physical blessings, but heir of eternal life. We connect with Abraham on that point where God was promising eternal life by faith. So the issue in faith really is going to be about in uh, who is the object of our faith. Romans chapter 4. Yesterday, one of the things we were talking about were the issues of prayer. And I say, perhaps one of the things that the grace movement negatively has affected, and that's personal prayer life. But the other is that unique identification that we have with Abraham and how we're blessed with him. Once again, verse 16, therefore it is imputed righteousness now. It is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure. To all the seed. Now, who's he talking about? All the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God. And here's the other thing. I think that there's such a... that believers just don't have the personal relationship and affection for God that others have. That we don't have that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that perhaps others do. Because... Right division can become very intellectual. I mean, the, <laughs> it's the facts. Read the facts. The facts are there. 
But it doesn't honor God for us not to hold and to esteem his son. It doesn't honor God when we don't give him the glory. And this is what Abraham was doing. Abraham believed even God. Abraham was able to take a look at his body. Abraham believed it was God who quickeneth the dead or gives life to that which has no life. And Abraham believed God, that it was even God, that God the Father was the one. And both Abraham and Sarah, they had reached that point in time in their life when it was no longer humanly possible for them to bear children. Come to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 In verse 11. See, I like this verse. I'm getting where I can identify more and more with this verse. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. And well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After... I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Here's a great thing, though. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, thou just laugh. He, she laughed within herself, <laughs> but the Lord heard her. And she's afraid. That was, a very in, that was just a very improper time for me to laugh is what she was thinking. I'm sure I'm going to be in trouble for it, but she wasn't. Abraham laughed. Sarah laughed. Why did they laugh? It's funny. <laughs> it's like Ma and Pa Kettle. Y'all remember them? <laughs> well into years. Can you imagine Ma and Pa Kettle coming home one day and having to tell their children, <laughs> you know, you're, you're fixing to get another brother or sister. Abraham and Sarah and God have a sense of humor. That's one of the things I appreciate about Fellowship Bible Church. <laughs> we, may, we have a sense of humor. Now, there are times that may border on being irreverent, but... <laughs> but, you know, things we do and say are funny. And so here's Abraham and Sarah... And they're old. <laughs> and Sarah says, I'm way past my prime for getting children. And God says, Sarah, don't count me out. You know who my heart goes out, though, to today? It's those families who, for whatever reason, today they can't have children. And they just sit back and they pray that God would open the womb for them. Not going that this just isn't something that God is doing today. We don't have the same promises that God had made to Abraham and Sarah. And they go along and say, what is wrong with me? Does God think I wouldn't be a good parent? What does he know about me that he won't let me have children? I've talked to people whose heart was broken over that. So Sarah says, no, 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 I didn't laugh. And I can just imagine what she felt laughing. He said, oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> but he wasn't mad at her, and that's the main thing. So from Abraham and Sarah's perspective, their flesh was old, but Abe believed the promise that God had made him. Sure, he believed the promise. But who was his faith really in? His faith was really in God. 
Today we look at it and we say, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And Abraham's such a good example of faith. And we look at verse 18, Romans 4, 18. Here's Abraham, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now look at this, verse 22. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Every time today, I think there's a parallel truth. Every time today we step out in faith believing God and His Word to us, it's counted unto us for righteousness. Taking God at His Word because He is God, He's the one that spoke every word in our Bible. Of course, we know, better rightly divide it or you'll come away with some false truth. But who wrote the book? God wrote the book. He inspired. He spoke every word. And we have it today. But why should Abraham not consider, even after all these years, Sarah and Abraham could have never had children? Why shouldn't he consider that? Why couldn't he just consider the fact he is. You know, he, he worked out through some things. Let me offer to you Eleazar, and we can, we can work this out. But God says, no, I'm going to fulfill my promises. But Abraham believed God. Come to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 to 18. Here's what Abraham knew about God. He says, when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. I'm sure glad he didn't call on me to verify his ability to keep his word, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, Abraham obtained the promise. He says in verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. You ever heard of peace treaties? They're not very enduring in many cases, are they? Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutable immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, one was the oath, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have, as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. I mean, what better thing? Two immutable things. One, he made an oath to Abraham. And two, he can't lie about it. Two immutable things. So Abram exercised his faith in God. What took all the doubt out of Abraham and ultimately Sarah? It was faith in God. Now, you know, we just need to recognize God has not made any of us a promise that we would be the father of many nations. But he has made us some promises. His promises are that we have been forgiven of all of our trespasses. 
His promises are that we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. His promise to us is that we have been given, have, present tense, been given the gift of eternal life because we believed and trusted Christ as our Savior. These are the things that God has promised us. He made an oath to us that if we would believe and trust Christ as our Savior, we would have the gift of eternal life. And we can believe it because God can't lie about it. Somebody said, you know, is it impossible for God to lie? And I said, no, only he just says in his sovereignty, he says, I'm not going to. He's not going to. Have you ever made that promise? Dave, don't raise your hand. Oh, you're just scratching his arm. <laughs> I said, I don't know what to do with that if Dave's over here. <laughs> I thought we were going to have a testimony time here. <laughs> I've made all kinds of silly promises. And uh, my word is not as true as the Lord's is. You know, we think about the Scripture, we think about all that goes on in our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ today. And come back to Romans chapter 4. So what would the point be today? I mean, we have, we certainly have talked about Abraham, his faith, and the promises that God had made him. I'm not sure what else can be said about that. I think we need to be reminded of it, and especially reminded of it in the context of, that, of how it was given to, uh, to Abraham. The real challenge that we receive from Abraham is what do we think about God? I trust we have the same unwavering, unyielding faith and confidence in God. Verse 16, Romans chapter 4, Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, Jews and Gentiles, time past, but now, ages to come. Not to that only which is of the law, so it's not only to those of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, which he was about a when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, not his faith. He was strong in believing in the faithfulness of God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. I've been asked before, is it really important or necessary to believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 3 and 4, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Why is it important? It's part of our gospel message. So if we, like Abraham, 
We can have righteousness imputed to our account as well, in verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who delivered, who was delivered for our offenses, and raised again for our justification. The wages of sin is death. Not just spirit, physical death, spiritual death. When the Lord Jesus Christ was on Calvary and the sins of the whole world of all of mankind was placed on him, it killed him. He died. But when he shed his blood, the quality and the sufficiency of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was so sufficient that God could say, you know, he completely and totally paid the price for, my, for all sin, and based on that, he raised him from the dead. Today, as an unbeliever, we're just as dead in our own sin as the Lord Jesus Christ was the day he was crucified. And it would take the same power, the same almighty power that God directed at his son to raise him from spiritual death. God directs that as us, too. When we, by faith, believe that Christ died for our sins, we're raised from spiritual death. We're given spiritual life. We're seated in the right hand, in the heavenly place, on the right hand of God. For God is free to deal with us in grace based on the merits of His Son and what He accomplished for us. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank You for just the testimony that Abraham had in his faith towards You. And as we learn about his faith towards you, we're just reminded that that carries over to our faith today, not only in you, but in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we exalt him and glorify him, and in doing so, exalt you as well. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray for his sake. Amen.